my name is Rath Vanithambi. I am very happy to introduce uh, my friend uh, and our next colleague, uh, Dr. Halim uh, Yaniko Miroglu. Uh, Halim uh, and I were uh, in uh, grad school at uh, University of Toronto around the same time, a uh, few years apart. Um, uh, Halim is currently a professor at uh, Carleton University uh, in Canada. Uh, Halim contributed a lot uh, to 4G and 5G technologies and standards. Uh, his extensive collaboration with industry resulted in um, 38 granted patents already. Um, Halim is, uh, Halim's research um, recently has been on 6G and non-terrestrial networks that we are excited to hear more about, uh, about it today. Uh, Halim is a um, uh, fellow of IEEE and as well as um, uh, Engineering Institute of Canada and the Canadian Academy of Engineering. Without any further ado, uh, let's welcome our speaker to talk about 6G and beyond 6G high altitude platform stations network. Today, uh, I will talk about the wireless access architecture of the future. Uh, wireless uh, architecture evolves at a speed uh, lower than actually the 10 year cycle. Uh, when we talk about physical layer technologies or some signal processing technology, a 10 year cycle is perhaps more appropriate from a generation to another generation, the subsequent one. But once again, architecture uh, evolves uh, slower Therefore, today I will attempt to look even uh, beyond 6G. Obviously, it is not very meaningful to use the term 7G, but I will, uh, at the end of my talk, have an outlook towards 2040s. Um, throughout my career, uh, starting uh, my graduate study days now uh, over three decades, um, one core research focus has been the wireless architecture. So the things I will be talking today is not uh, something that occurred to me last weekend or last month, but it is uh, a result of really years of uh, thinking on these subjects. And uh, my perhaps a little bit biased opinion is that uh, this high altitude platform station networks are, uh, it, it is an evolution in the cellular architecture, but it is impact can be so huge that it is a real revolution to the extent that since the beginning of cellular, if we take it back to 1970s, that is half a century, from the architecture viewpoint, this might be the biggest uh, step forward. Um, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, my research group and uh, collaborators in industry and academia. Many of the ideas, of course, uh, uh, as a result of uh, discussions like, like tonight. I teach at Carlton University in the national capital, Ottawa. Uh, we have the only uh, Bachelor of Engineering in Communications Engineering program in Canada. And telecommunications engineering is, uh, is a jewel of the university. Carlton ranks number 19 in the world uh, in this area. So here is the flow. Uh, first, I will uh, talk about uh, the general concepts and the terminology. Terminology is a little bit maybe uh, nuanced. Um, I will then talk about uh, state of the art in satellite communications, uh, which is high throughput satellites. And then some more discussion on high altitude platform station systems. Uh, and I will present this architecture as a conducive structure uh, for integrated communications, computing, caching, sensing, navigation, and so on. And I call this a vertical headnet. And I will uh, have some uh, forward looking closing remarks. Um, you might have seen uh, pictures of this sort quite busy. It refers to an integrated terrestrial aerial satellite network architecture. 
The ground part is uh, something we are all very familiar with and it is evolving uh, all the time. Um, uh, aerial part, there are uh, drones which can be UEs themselves or they can be relays or base stations actually. Uh, 3GPP already endorsed this as a UXMB, uh, an aerial base station. Uh, drones, as you know, are at an altitude of about 100 meters or so. Um, at the very outer side, there are satellites of different sorts. Today, I will not talk about satellites, but the focus is this less known element, um, high altitude platform station. Uh, on the semantics here, or the terminology, I should say, NTN is a 3GPP term, non-terrestrial networks. It used to refer to an integrated uh, ground aerial satellite architecture, but more and more 3GPP uses uh, NTN for exclusively integrated satellite uh, terrestrial network and aerial network discussion is often uh, made outside the NTN definition. Now, um, uh, we are all very familiar with um, LEOs, low Earth orbit satellites. They are very popular in the media thanks to SpaceX, Starlink, Amazon, Kuiper, and so on. But as I said, the less known part is a high altitude platform uh, stations. According to a um, 25 year old definition of ITU, uh, HAPS is a station at an altitude of uh, 20 to 50 kilometers, by the way, although ITU allows up to 50 kilometers, all the projects that I am familiar with, altitude is indeed around 20 kilometers. So throughout this talk, I'll just focus on that altitude. And an important characteristic, HAPS is fixed, uh, or it moves you know, slightly uh, with respect to an Earth observer. And this is the biggest uh, difference of HAPS from satellites. Or maybe I should say two different. First of all, satellites uh, are uh, at much higher altitudes. Even if we take LEOs, low Earth orbit, they would be between 400 kilometers to say 2000 kilometers. So the lower end of LEOs, uh, we are talking about 400 kilometers, but HAPS is at 20 kilometers. So 20 times closer to Earth. And uh, HAPS, uh, is non orbiting uh, as such. Lots of the, especially networking issues, uh, uh, which are there due to the movement of satellites, very fast movement of satellites, are not there uh, in, uh, in HAPS discussions. Now, a HAPS is an uh, aircraft at the end of the day, and it might be in one of the three different forms, at least this is what we have today. Uh, it might be in the form of an, a balloon, uh, for instance, uh, now terminated balloon project of uh, Google. Uh, it might be like a, a, a Zeppelin. Uh, a prime example is uh, Thales' Stratovas project. Or uh, also increasingly popular fixed wing aircraft. Now, fixed wing aircraft will not be uh, stationary in a literal sense, it will be making some figure eight movements uh, with a radius of say two kilometers. Uh, now, what is very interesting in the HAPS discussion is that this area has been uh, part of the aerospace industry due to obvious reasons. But now, as you see SoftBank, that is the Japanese operator and Deutsche Telekom, uh, they have big HAPS subsidiaries. So operators are showing big time interest in this area. Recently, uh, GSMA and uh, some other uh, operator fora published in the last several months a number of uh, HAPS uh, white papers. ITU has been the big uh, supporter or actually uh, the big push of uh, pusher, if there's a word like that, uh, for the HAPS ecosystem. But when we say ITU, there are two extremely important 
points we have to keep in mind, ITU's interest for decades now in HAPS is for a good reason, and that is what is what we call today digital divide, basically uh, uh, in uh, not only remote, but even rural areas, uh, terrestrial network is expensive due to the sparse population. Therefore, coverage is weak or non-existent. Uh, at least that should be, that was the case in the older days. So HAPS is, uh, has been considered as an alternative to the terrestrial network, a low cost alternative. And for that purpose, for the last uh, quarter century, ITU has been dedicating very generously spectrum for HAPS applications, but a very big but there at, spec at frequency bands other than IMT. IMT is of course cellular. So HAPS has been perceived as a standalone network, uh, like a standalone satellite network if it is uh, deployed, the user would need a separate device, but no one wants a separate device, right? Uh, uh, this fact that uh, perhaps uh, has been uh, perceived by ITU uh, as a system uh, different than uh, the cellular network uh, has been, in my view, the biggest reason why we haven't seen large scale uh, HAPS uh, deployment so far. So um, I, I would like to just uh, very quickly look at what is cooking in ITU and 3GPP. I hope I will not lose you. It might be a little bit boring, but this terminology is important. Now in ITU, there is a working part of 5C and 5D. 5C is for, or has been, or it is for satellites, fixed systems, and HAPS has been part of uh, 5T. And uh, IMT, that is cellular, is part of 5T. So this is a big issue in the sense that in ITU, uh, 5C and 5T are two different ecosystems. Uh, the cellular community is on the 5T part, and they are not parts or they have not been parts of the HAPS discussion. There is a big change happening in ITU. Um, recently, ITU came up with a new term. It is a bit ugly. It's called HIPS, that is HAPS as an IMT base station. So HAPS is HIPS in ITU terminology is a type of HAPS in cellular bands, in IMT bands. Therefore, ITU now separated HAPS discussion into two. There is the good old HAPS discussion in 5C, that is like a pseudo satellite. But then the new discussion just happening as we speak, uh, HIPS as a, as, a, as a cellular base station. Now, interestingly, a similar evolution happening in 3GPP as well. Now, terrestrial satellite integration has been a long discussion item since early 1990s, there is literature on satellite GSM uh, integration and so on. Um, as I will uh, talk a little bit more, since there was no real pressing reason for a strong integration, this integration has not happened even in the 5G standardization. And we will see how uh, 6G standardization will, will unhold, unfold. Now, in uh, recent 3GPP documents, uh, we see the term NTN, non-terrestrial networks, um, and that used to include satellites and uh, also references to HAPS. Now, in 3GPP documents, they will use the term HAPS, but whenever you see HAPS in 3GPP context, it means HIPS because it is the one uh, in the terrestrial frequency bands. And then in 3GPP, there is also a separate section uh, in documents that will be UAS, uh, unmanned aerial systems for drones as users or uh, base stations. Now, what is brand new as of this summer, as of two months ago in 3GPP is that for the first time in 3GPP documents, 
uh, HAPS, that is HIPS in ITU terminology, is now a separate heading. This shows that uh, HAPS in many ways different than satellites, and I'm very happy to see this happen because this is what I have been advocating for a number of years now. Uh, so once again, in 3GPP, these three elements, drones, HAPS, and satellites, are now discussed in different headings because they have different salient features. Now, back to uh, ITU, uh, World Radio Conference happens every three to four years. Um, uh, the HAPS discussion started back in 1997. Uh, but what is new, as I mentioned, is that in the last uh, WRC in 2010-19, one of the agenda items for the subsequent WRC, that is 2023, was identified as HIPS, uh, and uh, frequency bands below 2.7 gigahertz uh, would be considered in 2023 uh, World Radio Conference uh, for a harmonized network with, uh, with the cellular network. So HIPS, or HIPS, I should say, in the ITU terminology is now being considered for the first time as an extension of the cellular network. And not only that, uh, there will be also discussion um, uh, on uh, inter-HIPS and HIPS to satellite communications as well. So we are now uh, talking about constellations, similar to satellite constellations. In 3GPP, uh, uh, satellite discussion again uh, had uh, a long history, but this uh, technical report 38.811 is uh, quite important. Uh, it is probably the most tangible uh, discussion. It started in May 2017. The document was out in uh, last year, around this time. And uh, this summer, uh, in uh, last week of June, first week of July, the first uh, release 18 workshop uh, took place. And as I mentioned, for the first time, uh, NTN and HEPs are separated uh, because of their very separate features. And the second uh, release 18 workshop is actually has started today. Um, Halim, the question is, oh yeah, it, it's a lot of interesting uh, uh, things that, you know, I, even myself, you know, knowing about 3GPP, you know, uh, unaware of a lot of things that you uh, brought up. Thank you. Uh, one question is uh, uh, the the inter hips and the hips to the satellite station. All those things are going to be part of it. But and also you mentioned you know less than 2.7 gigahertz. So the question is, is it are they using um, cellular bands to do inter hips uh, um, communication as well as hips to satellite communication? Uh, that part I am not sure, uh, uh, Rob. Uh, uh, below 2.7 gig is mainly for access part. Uh, the, uh, one reason is that uh, in addition to radio, FSO, free space optical, is a very strong contender uh, for tying access together as well as HAPS to satellites. Uh, and at, uh, at 20 kilometers above the ground, atmosphere is thin. Uh, so um, it, it is possible to use very high speed FSO links. Actually, uh, uh, Google's Loon project, uh, after being very uh, prevalent for almost a decade, as, as you know, it ended in January this year. But one big achievement, well, th that project had many achievements. Uh, some of them less known. One of them, they indeed demonstrated that it is possible to connect uh, different, well, in their case, balloons. Uh, they were a, 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 part, a type of HAPS at 20 kilometers with FSO links. So uh, FSO is, is the main technology in satellite mega constellations, especially in the next generation. It is a very hot topic laser inter-satellite links in the satellite discussion. And uh, I think it is uh, just a matter of time uh, that we will see that coming to this inter-HIPS and HIPS satellite links as well. 
So it will probably start as uh, hybrid radio FSO, but in the future, I uh, see that FSO uh, as point-to-point -point line of sight, uh, very, very suitable. Okay, thank you. Should I continue? Yes, please, yeah. Okay, so uh, this integration term, the term integrated is used uh, a lot in uh, this context, but uh, uh, I think uh, the, the meaning of the term is different when we talk about satellite and terrestrial and aerial and terrestrial. The reason is that satellite network and terrestrial network are two separate networks. Take Starlink. Not only that, it is a different operator, it is a different ecosystem. They just put up their satellite network uh, without really thinking about 3GPP. So after the fact, we are now talking about putting together two separate networks. But when it comes to HAPS, uh, it is at the very least a very tight integration or uh, even I find the term uh, not very productive in this discussion because it is the same network. So if we take HAPS as a base station, therefore I consider this as a vertical heterogeneous network in addition to small base stations and macro base stations, we have HAPS as a type of base station as well. And in my recent work, I use the term rather than HIPS, a super macro base station. Um, when we talk about macros and smalls, we really don't talk about integration. They are part of the same network. In my view, uh, HAPS as a super macro base station is just the next tier. And as I will uh, argue later in my talk, uh, this uh, new uh, vertical network is not only for connectivity, but many other functionalities uh, starting with computing. And once again, uh, I'm emphasizing that uh, in, in my view, the big use case for HAPS clusters and constellations will be urban areas in the context of smart cities and smart uh, societies. Uh, and once uh, it turns out to be a success uh, due to economies of uh, scale, now we can have a, a more uh, more deployments in the rural uh, areas and remote areas. We should also remember that in rural and remote, satellite is also a very important enabler. Uh, therefore, uh, perhaps is, the need for HAPS is questionable uh, in rural and remote. Um, let me continue. Uh, once again, we have a vertical headnet architecture in mind. I coined this term in 2019 in this paper, Transactions on uh, Wireless uh, Communications, and since then, increasingly, we are using uh, th this term uh, in our publications. Again, uh, a harmonized, a single network with different type of base stations, and in this understanding, uh, super macro base station that is HAPS is native. Uh, it is not integrated after the fact, and it is owned uh, by the same operator. And uh, actually, this is indeed the way to go, what is happening with SoftBank and Deutsche Telekom. So um, at some point uh, in metro areas, we might have a HAPS super macro base station or a cluster of HAPS and uh, uh, as I will explain more, with different types of beams, they might be giving uh, connectivity and computing for uh, many different applications, whether it is aerial highways or terrestrial highways, hotspots, backhauling of small cells, so on and so forth. Next. Uh, I'm quite behind schedule, but uh, good that we have still some time. Uh, high throughput satellites. Actually, I will not go into too much detail. I am here discussing HTS with a view to extract important conclusions to be used in uh, 
uh, deployments. It shows, uh, oh, by the way, uh, high, sometimes in the literature, uh, uh, people call very high throughput satellite, ultra high throughput satellites, but I just use the term HTS in my presentation. And here is uh, what I can say, uh, state of the art, Parsat, for instance. Now, you might be saying that, hey, this was launched uh, a, century, sorry, a decade ago, but geosatellites, uh, CARSAT, well, until recently, HTS satellites are all geo, uh, geo Earth orbit, geosynchronous, that is at 36,000 kilometers. Their uh, lifespan is 15 to 20 years. So although this is launched a decade ago, it is still a state of the art. Uh, it has many beams. So when it comes to high throughput satellite, then satellite industry moved from broadcast TV and radio broadcast to broadband internet, the enabling technology has been multi-beams. So when you hear HTS, it really means multi-beam. So in CARSAT, there are 82 beams. There is a reuse of one over four, as you see with the color map, it means like uh, 20 reuse opportunities. And uh, each beam has say around uh, uh, 2.5, uh, gigabits per second uh, rate uh, in aggregation, the entire uh, set of beams uh, have 90 gigabits per second. Um, this is a big animal, actually. The payload itself is one ton, um, and uh, it is DC power rating is 11 kilowatts. This is actually a typical 5G base station power rating. Um, yes. So this is again the state of the art. In the satellite literature in the last several years, uh, these, uh, this mult very high number of beams is a very active uh, uh, research topic. Uh, and as we are talking about very high number of beams, one thing that should kept in mind is that beam width is getting narrower and narrower. So today, uh, or in the upcoming satellites, I should say, uh, 0 0.3 degree, which is really pencil beam, is, uh, is the norm. And uh, this is basically what is coming uh, next year or after. It is uh, Viasat, another HTS type. It is uh, a, a geo uh, satellite. Um, and it has about 1,000 beams. Uh, all incredible. Uh, uh, there is this paper from Signal Processing Magazine two years ago, which uh, describes uh, the SAT 3. Uh, so the total capacity is terabits per second across 1,000 beams. Now, let us look at uh, LEOs. Now, what is interesting is that the high throughput discussion which means a very high number of beams that started in the context of geos. Geos are big, massive. They have lots of real estate. But now that discussion is, has already come to LEOs. Um, well, actually, let me advance the slide. On the left side, you see Starlink. And on the right side, the Canadian Telesats. Uh, light speed constellation. We obviously hear a lot about Starlink, but uh, indeed uh, Telesat, uh, in many ways, Telesat's constellation, upcoming constellation, uh, has uh, more advanced features than uh, SpaceX. Uh, SpaceX is huge. Um, the target later this decade is uh, 12,000 Leos, and that number may reach to 40,000 in the next decade. We will see how that will unfold. Telesat is only about 300 satellites. Uh, they are higher than uh, Starlink, um, and they are bigger. So their launch mass is 700 kilogram in comparison to 260 uh, Starlink satellites, uh, and power rating is a little bit higher as well. Uh, the total constellation capacity is 50. Uh, 15 terabits per second across 300 LEOs. That means 50 gigabits per second uh, per LEO. Uh, 
uh, and uh, uh, in each of those LEO satellites, there are close to 700 beams, and uh, the number of, well, a beam is like a cell in our uh, more familiar cellular terminology, more than 100,000 beams uh, across the network. Just for comparison, uh, capacity per satellite uh, in Starlink is in the order of 20 gigabits per second. Now, uh, what are the major trends in high throughput satellites? There is this paper from last year written by uh, ESA researchers, European Space Agency. Uh, I recommend uh, anyone who would like to learn more. Uh, the 5G in an integrated system, 5G use cases are articulated. And interestingly, the use cases do not require a very tight integration. So look at them, communications on the move. This uh, means a train or uh, an airplane or backhauling uh, or uh, white area IoT. Basically, they are not talking about a cellular device connecting to satellites directly or, uh, or, uh, or a cellular network, rather, a, a, a smartphone would connect to the train, and the train is backhauled to satellite network. Likewise, in a remote community, you might be talking to the base station by using 5G, but then the base station is backhauled to the satellite network. So this is an important point. A tight integration between terrestrial network and satellite network is not a necessity, it seems, in the near future. And uh, important technologies, again, is uh, uh, these uh, antenna arrays, uh, phase arrays, and uh, very aggressively research community is working narrower and narrower beams, uh, even less than 0 0.2 degrees. Um, uh, um, I'll just uh, maybe part the discussion there. Um, uh, basically, RRM radio resource management is becoming uh, important uh, because we want to incre increase the reuse. Uh, the beams are like <coughs> GSM type of uh, color code is there. Uh, it is possible to use more advanced uh, interference management technologies to increase the reuse, uh, therefore, for a given number of beams, the capacity will increase. And uh, as we discussed briefly earlier, uh, laser inter-satellite links uh, is becoming uh, a very important enabler as well. So anyhow, in conclusion of this section, there is a lot of talk uh, in everywhere, in academia, IEEE, 3GPP, in agencies, and so on, on terrestrial satellite integration. Uh, and I should also say that uh, satellite industry is not monolithic. We can indeed divide it that into two segments. There are the legacy aerospace industry um, uh, uh, players uh, like Hughes or uh, Telesat again, but then there are the newcomers like Starlink, uh, Amazon, um, these people are even less engaged, the newcomers, with the 3GPP uh, ecosystem. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, my prediction is that uh, in the 5G era, we will indeed see uh, a light integration. Actually, already Starlink, uh, Bezos had a keynote in the in uh, in, in the last. Uh, Mobile World Congress virtual in uh, late June, I guess, uh, he mentioned that Starlink had already several contracts with 5G operators for backhauling. So when we are talking about backhauling, we are talking about light integration. Now, satellites reaching directly smartphones or wearables uh, with an IMTA interface, that is strong integration, and that is tight in integration. And I think we have to wait to, to 2030s, perhaps, uh, for that. Let me pause there for a second, if there is a quick question.
Um, Halim, yeah. maybe I yeah, can yeah. ask a question on that one. So the, for the um, direct um, um, uh, connection to the uh, smartphones for that one. Uh, so you mentioned like, you know, 2030, probably we will see it. Okay, what is feasible? What is not feasible yet in the meaning? Uh, like, is that the standards allow already? Only the implementation is yet to be done? Or no, no, it is, it, is, it is not standards issue, Rat. It is simply link budget issue. So if we take an application, uh, of course, uh, it uh, will have a certain bit error rate requirement. Uh, meaning that there will be a certain minimum EB over and not. Uh, EB is received power divided by rate, meaning that if we are talking about high rate application, uh, although the received power might be decent, as, long, as soon as rate increases, EB becomes too slow, too small, sorry. So uh, today, due to just the distance, Satellites are, uh, the, the pack loss is high, uh, despite the fact that antenna gains are very high, uh, meaning that today, uh, even with LEOs, high rate applications like video streaming is not possible. There is not sufficient EB over and not. But if you are talking about IoT, that is possible uh, because, uh, you know, low rate applications, especially delay. Uh, insensitive with ARQ possibilities and so on. That is doable, but not uh, uh, not video streaming. Now, uh, right, there is a satellite uh, area. Uh, I, as we were chatting earlier, I, today I'm not talking, but I have a lot of research going on in that framework as well. There are lots of uh, startup companies uh, with the goal of uh, reaching the smartphone directly. If, if that happens, you know, just let me give you an example. This is very interesting. Um, today, uh, 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 just I'm uh, just the name escaped me. The most prevalent uh, global satellite network, um, Iridium, Iridium Next, which got uh, a revamp two three years ago. They have 66 satellites. They have 1.4 million customers globally. Only 1.4 million. Compare that with some 6 billion uh, cellular customers. So if satellites reach the user equipment directly, that is big disruption. So we are talking about three orders of magnitude bigger market. And uh, Many companies are betting to that. Uh, and uh, again, the arithmetic is actually simple, just uh, to have a proper link budget. So one technology, there is a startup, an American-Israeli company, very strong, and I, the name just escaped me. Uh, they are planning to uh, put up a LEO constellation first in the, a small constellation around the equator, and then uh, if they uh, secure funding bigger towards the pole. Uh, 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 geo size satellites in LEO orbit. So the rule of thumb is that geo satellites are approximately 10 times bigger than LEO satellites, and therefore they can have five, six meter diameter dishes. And that results in uh, maybe like 20, 30 dB uh, excess antenna gain in the link budget and so on. So they are claiming that if we can have such big geotype LEOs, then the link budget would work. Uh, originally, NASA was very much against this proposal because of uh, the kind of contamination and space junk and things of that sort. but. Um, Somehow the company managed to uh, convince NASA and they got, they received a, a trial permit, permit. So we will see how that will evolve. Uh, a lot of innovation is happening um, in that area. Uh, we will see uh, in the coming years, yeah. Okay, thank you, yeah. Oh, 
Okay, so let us have a closer look in uh, to high altitude platform station systems. Well, um, many, oh yes, question? Yeah, Salim, I'm sorry to interrupt. I didn't mean to uh, cut you off there. Um, looking at what you had on the screen a uh, uh, few previous slides back and what's been uh, discussed so far, um, just a couple of questions about this technology. So it's going to be beamed through space, so it would have to travel through the ionosphere. Is this going to be directed energy to specific sources to be propagated, or is it going to be like directed directly to a home or a business? Uh, we are talking about satellites, right? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, yes. Now, satellites, uh, they have uh, the current a business case uh, have a number of uh, possible uh, operation modes. Uh, let us start with Starlink. Uh, Starlink requires, uh, or oh, sorry, uh, necessitates uh, a dish actually, and it has act a mechanical gear, so the dish literally moves as a satellite moves in the horizon. It takes about maybe 10 minutes to rise and uh, then set. Uh, so uh, you you get the satellite signal uh, to your roof or to your basically uh, driveway with a satellite dish, uh, Starlink dish, and then inside you can use Wi-Fi, for instance, for distribution. That that is a typical Starlink uh, modality. Telesat is different. Telesat is not targeting homes. But from the very beginning, Telesat's light, light speed network, uh, which is supposed to be operational in 2023, and Canadian government is supporting big time with uh, almost billion dollar loan uh, because of uh, the Canadian geography, rural, uh, northern communities, remote communities do not have appropriate internet access. There it is enterprise. So, uh, there might be a hospital or community center, which is an aggregation point or a hospital clinic. Yeah, uh, that is backhauled through uh, through. Just let me go to that slide uh, through light speed uh, or or uh, uh, 5G and LTE base station backhauling. Uh, but once again, uh, neither of them is for direct uh, terminal uh, access. Uh, as a matter of fact, even, uh, 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 even Elon Musk, uh, sorry, I said Jeff Bezos, I guess, talking in the uh, mobile world conference, I, I meant uh, Elon Musk. Yes, Elon Musk uh, admitted actually uh, last year that uh, it is even difficult to bring uh, the, uh, the satellite signal uh, to, to, the, to a vehicle when we are talking about uh, real broadband communications. Um, yes, I, I hope uh, I answered the question, but I, I, let me actually, uh, uh, Michael, mention the following. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the, it's a, we are a little bit trailing, but this is extremely important. Uh, both Amazon and uh, primarily SpaceX is making big investment. So both companies announced that their initial investment will be $10 billion, uh, but uh, they didn't say initial, like the first 1,000 satellites. I, I cannot imagine a full constellation of 12,000 LEOs uh, with a ground network for less than uh, $50 billion investment, $50 billion. Now, uh, how many customers are we talking about here? Starlink, as I said, uh, today the most successful operational satellite network, 1.5 million customers. So if you collect $1,000, it makes uh, $1,000 a year from an individual user, uh, it makes uh, a bit over $1 billion. $1 billion is not enough for operational cost, let alone exactly. making, uh, making a, a profit. So these folks, whether it is Bezos or Elon Musk, they have big plans. They are not telling it outright at the moment, but they want to 
uh, come closer to cities, and at some point they will become a competitor, a real competitor to a 3GPP ecosystem. And today it is uh, it, it 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 will we are getting hints of that happening. The discussion again started in remote and rural where uh, terrestrial network it's uh, not existent anyway. So it is a uh, a different customer pool, but now we are coming closer to metro areas, airports, industrial parks, and now uh, big uh, industries and again uh, and, uh, enterprise customers. And uh, I will actually talk a little bit more uh, later. Once we have in the metro areas a HAPS architecture, a HAPS constellation, HAPS can act as a relay for satellites as well. So satellites can reach customers directly through HAPS networks as well. So at some point, it is not difficult to imagine, for instance, in the US, cost to cost, maybe a million Tesla vehicles, all interconnected with a Starlink network, uh, in an uh, uh, autonomous and connected electric uh, vehicle paradise. So the plans are big, as we will uh, uh, we will see in the future, uh, but one step at a time. Okay. So since HAPS is, uh, deals with high altitude, is it a a blanket a, a blanket type technology? And if so, what is the wavelength that this will be blanketing uh, at? And is it like 5G, which has to have um, the distance on 5Gs is, is short, so they need more um, uh, projection in uh, smaller areas uh, or concentrated areas in order to blanket an area for 5G oh. for an effective signal? Is that the same with HAPS? Um, um, uh, first of all, uh, from now on, when I uh, discuss HAPS uh, again, just uh, maybe. Uh, parenthetical issue, but uh, really what we mean, HIPS in the ITU terminology, that is uh, HAPS part of the cellular system at the same cellular band. Uh, so uh, as we will see uh, in the coming slides, my thinking is that there will be a humongous number of uh, dynamically steerable beams uh, and at 20 kilometers uh, uh, a 0 0.2 degree beam width makes a cell, a hot spot of 70 meter radius. So you can even track individual vehicles, uh, yep. not tomorrow, yep. but uh, say 2030s. Um, and perhaps uh, one major advantage, even bigger advantage than Leo's is that it is big. Uh, it, is, it, it can be as big as a football field, like an ISS. Uh, which means that it can have huge antennas, huge payload, uh, a lot of things uh, we can do with HAPS that we cannot do with uh, satellites. And one thing that I will, well, uh, Michael, you stole my talk in the sense that I was planning to talk <laughs> all about this. Uh, actually, people think, uh, people think that, well, HAPS 20 kilometers, that is far, far away, but it is not. When it is line of sight, the path loss at uh, 20 kilometers is comparable to path loss at one kilometer when the path loss ex uh, propagation exponent is three. And similar to path loss at only 100 meters if the propagation exponent is four. So perhaps propagation, so path loss is very manageable. It is, uh, latency propagation delay is in the order of 150 microseconds. No latency issue. So uh, it, it looks far away, but it is actually uh, very close in, in many ways. Uh, how about we continue this discussion in uh, 15 minutes when I do a little bit more coverage? HATS has a long history, uh, unbelievable 60 years. HATS trials started back in 1960, and just to give you a, a reference, first satellite Sputnik is 1957. 
pretty much the same idea. <laughs> and the first half was a metallic reflector, just a dumb reflector without any payload. Uh, and then there were many projects. I, let me not get into details by NASA, by mainly government agencies in Canada Communications Research Center, uh, but without any commercial deployment, uh, obviously. Uh, the, this discussion started uh, getting hot by Google's high-profile Loon project, and that was that started as in the beginning 2011 as uh, a helium balloon and an LTE payload attached attached to that once again for rural and remote uh, connectivity, and um, basically when Starlink came. 2010-18 onward, uh, I guess commercially it became a very big challenge. Uh, that was the time when after almost a decade of trial and investment, Google uh, was looking for industrial partners and they realized that this may not happen anytime soon, so they pulled the plug. But uh, in this decade, there are a number of other projects and I have reasons to think that later in this decade, especially after 2023, 2023 is an important time. That is when ITU will allow uh, HAPS to be a part of the cellular ecosystem. So uh, starting rural and remote coverage, uh, we may be able to see uh, HAPS deployed by uh, operators. Now there is interest in addition to Japan and uh, Germany. In China as well, operators are uh, showing interest, at least to understand more. So I will highlight next uh, three high profile projects. The first one is this blimp or Zeppelin type of aircraft. It also has a 10 years of history. Uh, the, they had commercial deployment promise a few times, pushed forth. Uh, now, uh, mid this decade is the new time frame. Uh, payload is half a ton. Uh, the Zeppelin architecture allows a very large payload. And as you see in the view graph here, these different uh, Zeppelins are tied to each other with free space optical links. And its power rating is uh, similar to an LTE base station. And SoftBank's uh, Hubs Mobile initiative, they have a glider as an aircraft wingspan 78 meters. It is a more recent project. They also have uh, 2023 onward, I guess not before, I guess mid this decade uh, as a commercial operation. Of course, all of these are uh, a little bit wishful thinking. Uh, and uh, they, one of the technologies they are uh, bragging about is high energy density uh, lithium ion batteries. Um, uh, so their payload is much less in comparison to Zeppelin, but uh, they claim that this new battery technology allows uh, sufficient powering of the aircraft for uh, connectivity purposes. Arguably, the most advanced project that I am aware of is this one, um, uh, financed mainly by Deutsche Telekom. Uh, it is payload is designed by UK Cambridge consultants and the aircraft by SPL. It started rather recently. They also have a target of mid this decade. Uh, and uh, they have two unique technologies. One of them is their aircraft is a fixed wing aircraft, but it uses uh, uh, hydrogen fuel. Um, and uh, the other big technology they are betting on is similar to high throughput satellite, very high number of beam technology, uh, uh, individual steerable beams. So what we are seeing here is that these uh, uh, huge number of beams, this technology started with GEOS, next it came to LEOS, and now uh, that uh, ecosystem is considering that. This particular uh, design, uh, 
has uh, in aggregation promising more than 100 gigabits per second capacity across 480 uh, beams. So my thinking is that with all the know-how uh, and uh, trial experience developed this decade, the interesting story will start in the next decade. So next decade, uh, uh, most likely the 6G standards will be out uh, later this decade. So 2030s is in many ways, we are talking about beyond 6G, even mid 2030s, uh, 7G standardization if the usual 10 year cycle continues. So on top of metro areas, you know, to take a city like New York or Shanghai or uh, Bangalore, uh, uh, a, a city 10 plus million people, and we will have more and more mega cities, that goes without saying, there will be either single HAPs or a cluster of HAPs I envision uh, for a variety of reasons. So let us see what are those reasons in this vertical HEPnet uh, architecture. Well, let us start with an interesting pointer. Uh, let me open again a parenthesis here, ultra-massive MIMO. Certainly this is a big technology uh, for 5G. It is an enabler for 6G as well. With more, if we have more than 1,000 antennas, for instance, we can have these very narrow uh, beams, lots of capacity, but, Take this MIMO, ultra-massive MIMO, and put it in city clusters. So as soon as it is within the city cluster, due to coverage, the, uh, the area is very low. You might have a terabits per second capacity, but only in few blocks uh, because of uh, blockage, especially in millimeter wave, uh, the signal doesn't go further. So it is, it is really, a wasted capacity in that sense. And here comes the beauty of HAPS. What if I put that ultra massive MIMO structure in HAPS in the sky? I have a thousand beams. I can generate them at different beam widths based on the need. If it is IoT, you know, it is a bigger beam. If it is a single user or a vehicle, much smaller hotspot and all the resources are pooled and uh, based on where in the city, this might be you know, 10, 20, 30 kilometer radius, wherever the capacity is needed, uh, that unpredictable demand, I can just shoot a beam there. This is arguably the most important strength of the HAPS network, it brings agility. I don't need to put base stations in an ultra dense manner on the ground so that each user will be close statistically to a base station. And then most of the time that base station remains idle. Rather, from the very basics of traffic engineering, I am pooling my resources. So this is, you know, uh, tens of base stations together located at the central point and they are shooting beams whenever necessary, wherever necessary. Let us make a quick back of the envelope uh, calculation. 2030s, remember, we are not talking about this decade. So if I have 10 gigahertz of bandwidth, a combination of uh, millimeter wave, and then the lower end of the terahertz band, that is W band, uh, D band, G band, D band is interesting up to 130 uh, gigahertz. Let us say I have 10 gigahertz of bandwidth at a spectral efficiency of four bits per second per hertz. If I have a thousand beams with a reuse of one over four, which means uh, uh, 250 reuse possibilities, it makes uh, uh, a huge 10 terabits per second uh, aggregate capacity. And if I have 10,000 beams, note that 1,000 beams is a possible in the next few years uh, in, in LEOs. So in 2030s, it may be possible to have 10,000 beams 
at a huge infrastructure, again, ISS size. And in that case, we are talking about 100 terabits per second aggregated capacity, which can be used in the most efficient ways. So this might be the footprint of perhaps, let us say, this might be a greater Toronto area, for instance. I have small beams, hot spots, bigger ones and bigger ones. And as the demand moves, the beams uh, are uh, moving as well. As I was uh, mentioning to Michael earlier, uh, 0 0.2 degree beam width will make 70 meter diameter uh, hot spot on the ground. So uh, high altitude platform station as a super macro base station, as I said, uh, we might uh, use even the lower tail of terahertz. Uh, the community is already talking about 100 gigahertz uh, carrier in, for satellites. Uh, if, if that is uh, a discussion topic, certainly that should be a discussion topic for HAPS as well at 20 kilometers. But uh, in order for indoor penetration, sub gigahertz, sub six gigahertz can also be used. So HAPS will be used, will be using a number of bands, um, uh, and uh, backhauling can be whenever uh, possible through free space optical. As I mentioned, uh, this uh, aggregation of massive capacity uh, have lots of uh, impact that I even cannot talk all of them today, uh, including greenness. This is a green technology. It, uh, it doesn't need an over-engineered, over-provisioned terrestrial network. We can have the terrestrial network for the median load and the excess load, the unpredictable part, can be, uh, uh, can be served by HAPS, for instance. So let us have a look at a few use cases. When I started playing with HAPS a number of years ago and even I didn't use the term at that time. This is our first paper, uh, IEEE Communications Magazine, almost four years ago. So we thought that, okay, you know, what might be, so this is probably the first paper in the literature which uh, puts forth a HAPS use case for urban uh, uh, deployments. Now, small cells are very important, uh, important that goes without saying, but one issue is that backhauling um, because fiber may not be readily available. So we said that put your small cell, wherever you deem appropriate, and then have a mixed uh, RF, hybrid RF uh, FSO uh, backhauling to the HAPS, uh, then uh, the signal can be brought back to an FSO gateway. Uh, this paper uh, had big traction in the literature, and uh, at just two months ago, this received the uh, IEEE 2021 threat Elastic uh, Prize uh, for the best uh, magazine paper published in the last uh, three years. Another application for uh, HAPS is aerial highways. Um, uh, the cargo drones and drones of various sorts will be part of our lives. I did a calculation uh, in GTA, Greater Toronto Area, if there is one delivery per household per day, at any given time, there will be 10,000 cargo drones. Um, you can, how do you give coverage uh, for navigation and other purposes to these drones? Well, you can use the terrestrial network, which will result in so many uh, handoffs and very inefficient. Why don't you serve with, uh, with a HAPS? Uh, the control plane can be HAPS at the HAPS, so without any handoff, uh, a, a drone which uh, uh, goes from a, a mega retail store at the one end of a mega city to the other end uh, in this way. So we have actually two magazine papers on this topic. The first one came out in Vehicular Technology Magazine, September issue is already out. 
another magazine paper in communications magazine September issue, but uh, it will be published in a few weeks. Um, so let us go back to this very first half. Uh, again, I find this super interesting. Back in 1966, there was a constellation of 46 HAPs operational for, uh, as a dumb reflector to increase the uh, radio coverage. But uh, those are old days. We are you know, uh, 50, 60 years ahead. Now we are not talking about dumb reflectors, but we are talking about reconfigurable smart surfaces. For the first time in the literature, we uh, proposed uh, RSS for HAPs in this communications magazine article came out earlier this year. And uh, just last month, a follow-up paper came out doing a very careful link budget analysis. Um, the fact that HAPS has a large real estate, a large surface, it is very conducive for uh, recon reconfigurable uh, smart surfaces. This might be a topic by itself, uh, but let me just stop that discussion there. Another application is transcontinental highways, whether it is in Canada or uh, in Australia, in Africa, in Siberia. Most of the population in Canada is actually in a band of 100 kilometers around the Trans-Canada Highway. Imagine a constellation, a linear constellation of 50 maps giving coverage here for intelligent transportation uh, systems applications, as well as helping the population around. Let us uh, shift gears to computing. Um, obviously, caching and edge computing is very big in 5G. Uh, only limited uh, applications so far, uh, but it is just coming a matter of time. Uh, and uh, this is also deriving uh, 6G discussions. Um, uh, so what we have today is um, uh, cloud computing, that is the old paradigm in the core network. And what is new is uh, edge computing at the macro base station, and then fog computing at, uh, at the small base station. So what we are proposing is to just open a space between the uh, core network and the edge network, and I temporarily call this border computing, uh, and uh, here is HAPS. So HAPS is in the hierarchy another level, uh, another layer, sorry, for uh, caching and computing. We have ongoing work for instance, this one under review in transactions on wireless communications, caching and computation of loading in HAPS assistant uh, intelligent transportation systems. Yet another application area, I know that we have only about maybe five minutes. Um, think applications like federated learning, compressed sensing, digital twins, all extremely hot topics. Uh, today, the individual uh, macro base station data uh, is pushed to core network for further aggregation. But that is a very suitable platform with it is a single shot bird's eye line of sight view of a large area. If you do federated learning, you don't need to do it in two, three uh, tiers in a tree architecture. You can do that in one shot. Changing the discussion again, uh, as we know, uh, localization is one of the new features in 5G. Uh, now we are uh, uh, the uh, topics of uh, release 18 is being identified, and once again, localization is uh, among the top of the list. Uh, uh, however, in reality, uh, the terrestrial network, in, with the terrestrial network, there are not sufficient anchor points. In order to do localization, you need uh, at least four anchor signals from four different macro base stations. 
Uh, but this recent study shows that uh, actually, if, if you look at uh, the blue curves for outdoor, uh, most of the uh, users will not have four uh, clean uh, macro base station signals for accurate localization. What if I use, use HAPS for that purpose? So imagine again GTA, uh, Greater Toronto Area. On one end of the city, Scarborough, another end, Mississauga, I put two hats. So readily, most users have two anchor nodes. You, if you can find two other terrestrial anchors, you are ready to go. Localization, navigation, positioning is becoming increasingly important for obvious reasons, uh, including uh, autonomous and connected vehicles paradigm, but also autonomous and co connected UAVs paradigm. In many applications, you will need a centimeter level of accuracy. This is yet another uh, very good application for those purposes. Again, we are relying on the bird's eye view uh, footprint of HAPS. And pretty much finally, this paper just came out uh, fresh uh, last week, although it is the August issue, uh, certainly uh, control and management of this integrated network is maybe a nightmare, especially if you include satellites as well. In 3GPP, the term is interdomain, so you have several networks um, in tandem mode, and if we are talking about end-to-end -end SDN network function virtualization and so on, uh, certainly AI and ML will play a very important role in control and management. Uh, the term in 3GPP starting release 8 LTE back in two, 2008 has been SOM, self-organizing network. So we introduced this new term, self-evolving network. SOM is within a network, but then we are talking about Tandem networks and an end-to-end -end, uh, issue, set of issues, we call this a self-evolving network sense. Well, HAPS have uh, many interesting features in comparison to satellites in particular. They are scalable. You don't need to start with 1,000 Leos. Just you put one on top of Portland. Uh, it is evolutionary. It is really part of the cellular ecosystem. Uh, it is fixed. Uh, that is very, um, uh, very good for networking issues, closer to ground, better path loss, better late latency. And it doesn't have all these legislation issues, uh, whether it is data privacy or uh, regulations. Uh, uh, because it just stays there in other uh, base station. Um, that is like a geo in some sense because it is fixed, but it has path losses, orders of magnitude uh, less, and latency is also uh, very small. Uh, even in comparison to LEO, free space path loss, there is almost 30 dB gain, and uh, the the latency in the air is just negligible. It is suitable for uh, edge computing. Uh, but different than LEO in the positive sense, it doesn't orbit. And it has a bigger, much bigger size, which is very suitable for uh, whether it is reconfigurable smart surfaces or large antennas. While in some ways it is like a macro base station, but as an advantage, it has a much bigger uh, footprint and many things uh, can be performed in one shot, as I discussed. And as I mentioned, uh, path loss is not too different than a macro base station. Here, uh, I'm assuming a uh, uh, line of sight connectivity with, uh, with the HAPS. Now, interestingly, most things that satellites can do, you can do with HAPS, even better. And most things you can do with macro base stations, you can also do with HAPS as well, even better. And certain things 
that you can neither do with satellites nor with macro base stations, they can be achieved by a HEP system. Uh, I just will open a parenthesis here uh, again. There are certainly things that, for instance, satellite can do, but not HEPs. One of them is uh, very long haul uh, uh, links. Uh, round trip time is less in, uh, uh, can be less in satellite networks. I have a separate line of research in that area uh, with uh, satellite links. Uh, I always put at the end of my presentation this disclaimer. Sometimes people take me as uh, I am uh, putting forth HAPS as an alternative to satellites. That's not the case. I am a big fan of satellite communications. I have a large team in my group working on satellite networks, which I really didn't talk about that research. Uh, uh, well, in conclusion, just uh, two slides. Let us have uh, an overlook towards 2040s. From the very beginning, there are three major issues with satellites. Two of them out of this, our community, that is the aircraft discussion. You need a high endurance aircraft. And then energy is also something very important because when you add more and more functionalities, especially computing, you need a lot of energy. Where will that energy come from? And then there are uh, ICT-related issues as well. That is uh, our domain. And that is indeed among the three, the, the easiest. This is uh, my last slide. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe in 2040s, uh, in the, in, on the top of a large metropolitan area, we will have a cluster of HAPS uh, nodes. They are tied to each other with very high speed free space optical links. And they are providing access with a very high number of beams with different beam widths uh, based on the application. Some of the applications we already talked about, whether it is aerial highways, hotspots, uh, backhauling, uh, but equally importantly, uh, this is a facilitator for other paradigms as well, including computing. For instance, we might have a distributed data center in, in the skies, uh, and, uh, navigation, security, you name it. So very interesting. We are not talking about access anymore. So then these clusters are also tied to the Toronto cluster, tied to Montreal cluster, also to the Leo, Leo architecture. Uh, we are also talking about transport as well as many of the core functionalities. I was planning to talk a little bit about the energy issue, but I think the time uh, doesn't allow. Uh, this year we had uh, six, seven concept papers already published or coming out. Uh, in the form of magazine papers. Uh, I'm extremely excited in this area. Uh, and again, I'm saying this based on my 30 years of uh, experience in access network architecture. I also have a YouTube channel, so you can Google that. And looking forward to uh, collaboration with uh, interested uh, people and companies. But many thanks uh, once again for the invitation. Right on time. Thank you very much, uh, Halim. Uh, in case if uh, anybody has any very quick question, you know, uh, probably, you know, you can say otherwise, you know, um, let's wait, you know, a anybody has any quick questions? Dr. Halim, I do have a question. This is Daniel. Can I go ahead? Of course, of course. Great. Uh, everybody loves the high, uh, the gobs and gobs of bandwidth at the high uh, frequencies, especially 100 terahertz. But my concern is that nobody wants to talk about the free space path loss, which is, of course, exponential with frequency. And for example, 20 kilometers at 100 terahertz, you'd have to be making up or being able to account for over 220 dB of free space path loss. And from a handheld device, um, that's going to be a tough one, isn't it? I, uh, yes, Daniel, but I didn't. Uh... 
100 terawatts terabits per second rate. So when we are talking about frequencies, uh, I am uh, for access like this access uh, beams. I am talking about um, which is already part of uh, 5G, um, as well as uh, in order to grab more frequency. Uh, what is perhaps a little bit misleadingly called terahertz. The terahertz starts from 100 gigahertz uh, in the technical community. So there is already uh, three bands uh, which are coming into the discussion of uh, INT, and those bands are W band, which is uh, 90 gigahertz, uh, D band, which uh, goes up to 130 gigahertz, and uh, a more maybe a provocative G band goes up to 300 gigahertz. So 100 gigahertz, in my view, is doable uh, for outdoor uh, 20 kilometers uh, line of sight. Um, this case optical is obviously another technology. Um, FSO is already used uh, extensively in space communications. Um, and FSO backhauling for LEO satellites uh, is the norm in next generation LEO networks. So uh, if satellites are backhauled by FSO, um, HAPS can certainly be uh, backhauled by FSO as well. Uh, did that clarify a little bit, Daniel? Yes, very much. Thank you very much yes. for that clarification. Makes it much clearer, obviously. Pleasure, pleasure. Right, thank you. Any other quick questions? All right, I think, you know, we already passed four minutes, you know, thank you, um, Halim. Thank you, all the audience for, you know, staying very late. Uh, thank you very much, Halim, for a very um, informative and very useful futuristic um, uh, topic discussion. You know, this is very useful. Thank you so much. Let's thank uh, our uh, speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Rat uh, and Pradeep for invitation. And uh, once yeah. again, if there are further questions, feel free to send me an email. Good night.